Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner and this is Sustainable Hawaii, airing live every Tuesday at noon at thinktechhawaii.com. Achieving a more sustainable Hawaii requires more sustainable transportation systems on all islands. A transportation system is truly sustainable if it reduces environmental impacts to net zero while providing safe and equal access to all members of society, regardless of their socioeconomic level. Meeting these criteria for our land transportation systems involves reducing the proportion of cars and increasing the supply and quality of alternative modes of travel. Our guest today will discuss multimodal land transportation planning and the intricacies of setting and achieving mode share targets for Hawaii. Both our guests are graduates of the University of Hawaii Urban and Regional Planning Department. Blue Planet Foundation's Clean Transportation Director, Shem Lawler, has brought with him fellow bike share expert, Daniel Alexander, who serves as Advocacy, Planning, and Communication Director for the Hawaii Bicycling League. Welcome, Daniel, and welcome back, Shem. It's good to be back. Thank you. It's, it's delightful to have you as usual, and especially to talk about what people really don't understand. What are modes, and what are mode shares? So a mode is just any way that people get around. So one mode would be car, another would be public transportation, bus or train. Uh, bicycling or walking are also uh, common modes that are measured. A mode share is the ratio or the percentage of people that take any individual modes. So for example, if you looked at, at Oahu, about 78% of Oahu uh, workers commute to work by automobile. So the auto mode share is about 78%. Wow, that's actually sounds very, very high, particularly for a small island state. Um, how does that compare to other places? It is, it is for, uh, for the U.S. In, in general, it's probably about average. Uh, I would say given our local conditions, we have fairly dense development. It's actually pretty poor. We could do a lot better. Okay. Daniel, I'm curious, how is transportation infrastructure planning done today to support mode sharing or maybe not support it? Well, I'll tell you, we're in a time of change in the way we approach transportation, but uh, some of the old tools, uh, the legacy of, of the past approach is still with us. And one of the prominent things is what's called level of service. And what that primarily looks at is how fast vehicles are getting through a given street. And so what that normally means is we end up putting more lanes in, and really the only unit of analysis is someone driving in a car. We don't even think about carpooling at that point. But what we're increasingly moving towards is a more complete streets and multimodal approach where we think about other modes. Um, and I think mode share is potentially one of the tools that will help us get there. It's interesting to me that that's the only way we've measured it. What about vehicle miles traveled? Is that not something, is that just pertaining to highways? Well, so here in Hawaii, uh, we, we don't use vehicle miles traveled um, to help us determine you know, what the road should look like. Um, and really one of the, you know, I guess most harmful approaches with the level of service right now is when we look at development, uh, when we do an environmental impact statement, mm -hmm. it really looks at um, how many cars it's going to put on the road. And uh, what it does is it ends up requiring developers to do things like add turn lanes, add lanes to a road, which often actually uh, makes it a less hospitable environment for those walking and biking and really just enables more driving. Well, you mentioned complete streets, and it's something that we've discussed on this show before with some of our urban planner guests. Um, how is, and a lot of people may not know what the complete streets planning model is. Tell us about that and how it helps. So complete streets is an approach um, where you think about all modes, where you think about people walking, people biking, people taking transit, people with disabilities, as well as people driving. Um, so really, it's a way of thinking about uh, our transportation system. Um, we're lucky that through the leadership of our city council in 2012, we passed a very strong complete streets ordinance that requires our transportation departments to be thinking about all, all of this whenever they're doing a transportation project. So Shem, I know they have to take that into consideration, but is there a law in the books that requires them to apply complete streets methodology and our developers to respond to that? So the complete streets uh, ordinance, as I understand it, at the, at the county level is... Uh, has to do with whenever the city goes in and touches the road. 
So it's more on the transportation side. So if the city's going to repave a road, they have to look at adding bike lanes or those kind of things. What, what we really wanted uh, to, to help change is kind of the system, systematic approach to transportation planning. And that's where setting mode share goals and mode share targets can really be beneficial. So a mode share target is something that's very high level. It, can, it actually can be uh, neighborhood specific or county specific or city specific, but it's a very high level way of thinking about transportation. So for example, um, uh, if the city were to set a, a mode share target for public transit of 20%, then they would you know, uh, be looking at all the policies and, and individual development and roads and complete streets of everything aiming towards that high level policy. So it's a much, it's a much more overall approach that helps uh, coordinate the individual policies and, and efforts that go into it. Now I know that there are some city, cities, particularly on the west coast, Vancouver and Seattle, that have done this. What, what are their targets and how are they doing in achieving them? Right. So uh, that's correct. Uh, two of the best examples of cities setting mode share targets are Seattle and Vancouver. Uh, several, a, a number of years ago, Vancouver set a mode share target uh, to, by the year 2020, have um, more than half of all trips to, from, and within the city be by walking, biking, or transit. Uh, so that means less than half the trips by, by automobile. They are, uh, surp they've already surpassed that today. So this graph that we have up is for Vancouver. Correct. Uh, in 2012, they, they uh, updated their, their goals, and now the new goal by 2040, they want to have more than two-thirds of all trips by walking, biking, and transit. Well, that probably explains why we all love going to Vancouver. Right. It's such a hospitable city. Uh, right. I'll say in Europe, these sort of goals are, are prominent as well. Uh, when you look to some of the great cities like Copenhagen or Vienna, um, these are really guiding principles for the way they're uh, developing. And they developed actually rather more naturally that way because they have been accommodating pedestrians for centuries. How are we going to make that shift to bring in what has always been you know, a very car-oriented society to bring in the multimodal and complete street infrastructure? So I, I think actually some of our neighborhoods um, on Oahu and elsewhere in the state are actually um, not that car-oriented development. We have some older streetcar neighborhoods such as Kaimuki. Oh, um, that's right. And those are the neighborhoods where we do see uh, higher levels of walking and biking. Um, but we know the recipe. Yeah, we, um, and as we're going to develop, we're going to develop a lot more in places like Ho'opili and elsewhere. Uh, we need to apply that recipe of, um, you know, a connected, mixed-use neighborhood that's relatively dense and has quality transportation options, including transit and, and good walking and biking environment. So the new Ho'opili development on the west side is incorporating all of this thinking? So I think they're incorporating much of it. Obviously, it's built around a transit station, so that's a big part of it, is its transit-oriented development. I think they could definitely go further. Um, there could be um, more intention in uh, trying to make it where it minimizes uh, the necessary trips via uh, auto vehicle. And how are we going to make them do that? Well, so that's a really good question you, you raised. So that this is why we believe that having mode share targets are important, because it's it's pretty easy to say things like we want sustainable transportation, we want to be a bike-friendly city or, or county. But typically when we say things like that or when we put policies like that in place, there's no metrics associated with them. So that means you could put in one bike lane or a Shero or something and, and you've checked that box. Or you could say we're near the transit station, we've checked that box. What we really want to do is change it so that there's a, a concrete metric that's tight that they have to that they have to live by. So a really good example is in, in, Van, in Seattle, when they decided to develop this one neighborhood called the South Lake Union neighborhood, they decided that we want to have a goal of less than 40% of all, all trips in that neighborhood be by car. And so when the developers went in to build in that neighborhood, instead of doing a normal transportation and uh, impact analysis like we would do here, they, they had to design the project and say how they were going to meet that 40% target. And so they incorporated things like secure bike parking, bike share, car sharing. But ultimately, they, in order to meet that target, they really had to restrict parking and, and implement things that really forced people not to drive. And so that's, that's what we'd like to see in places like Holopili, is have concrete, concrete metrics that they have to meet so that they're not just putting in uh, accoutrement, that they're actually building to try and hit that target of, of a specific 
uh, mode share for transit and bike and walking. And those targets really have to be based in reality. So what is the process of identifying and setting the targets? So I think um, part of it is that you look at existing conditions. Um, so what the transportation facilities are there, what sort of transit service we already have. Um, and then you look at what's attainable. You know, what, what can we build in the, in the coming period? Um, and I think the thing is with goals is we have to remember um, there is a certain aspiration in them perhaps or they're setting where we want to go. Uh, you know, it's like we're going to get towards 100% renewables. Right. We don't know exactly the path, but if we figure out something that is a large reach but attainable, um, then we will figure out the tools to get us there. Absolutely, and that's, you gave the best example, which is the 100% renewable energy target. And we're really living up to our uh, aspirations so far. So it's exciting to see. I, I, I'm going to be very excited to see how we do this in transportation. Because I think the hardest thing to do is get people out of their cars. Could I give another example? I yeah. think the Salt Lake Union that Shem mentioned is, is a powerful one. But Stanford University mm. uh, has an agreement with the county that it's in that it will add zero new parking spaces on campus. And yet the campus is growing. It's growing it by a lot. They're getting more facilities. They're getting more students. They're getting more researchers. So they are having to figure out all these solutions to get people to the campus via something other than car. They're using car share. They have a really great uh, bike share system and bikeway network. They have transit. Um, they're, they're figuring out all these solutions. You know, they have travel demand management uh, where they have people that work with um, each individual to figure out a way that they can not drive. Um, so I think when we set those goals, they might seem a little extreme, mm -hmm. but um, there's a lot of innovation out there and there are a lot of strategies that we can use to get there. And it actually spurs, it very much supports innovation by creating those targets. Right. You know, I'm, I've, uh, we had on the show Joanne Yukimura, who's a big proponent of the Kauai multimodal transportation plan. Is Kauai the only area in Hawaii that has one and are we going to really move towards creating a plan or how do the targets fit within that? I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So at the present time, Kauai is the only county in the state that has mojo targets. Back in 2011-12, when they were doing their land use plan, they decided to really try and merge land use and transportation, look at those two issues together. And they, they looked at uh, how traffic is increasing, and they, and they looked at how much they would have to spend on roadways, and they determined there's no way we can pay for that. And so they decided we actually need to reduce the number of cars on the road and try to solve our traffic through reduction rather than accommodating cars. And so they actually, at that time in 2012, they set some mode share targets uh, to reduce the number of, of cars and also particularly single occupant vehicles and increased transit. Now they, are, they have a long way to go. They're actually the most car dependent uh, island in the state, but they've taken the most important step, which is actually looking at the the land use and, and transportation components together and setting goals. Uh, last year, we, Blue Planet, uh, actually submitted a bill to the legislature. I'm going to hold you there. We're going to take a gr okay. break. And when we come back, we'll find out about this bill that Blue Planet helped sponsor in the legislature. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi with the Think Tech Hawaii show, Stacy to the Rescue, highlighting some of Hawaii's issues. You can catch it at Think Tech Hawaii on Mondays at 11 a.m. Aloha. See you then. Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man, and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon. ThinkTechHawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for a likable science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. Aloha, we're back with Sustainable Hawaii talking about multimodal, say that three times, Transportation Planning for Hawaii, and we have Shem Lawler from Blue Planet Foundation, and Daniel Alexander from Bike Share Hawaii. And Shem was about to share uh, about the bill that was introduced in the legislature last year that would require transportation planning for the state and some targets 
Tell us what happened with that bill and moreover what it contained or we're going to see it again. Right. So uh, the approach we took last year is we wanted to, to set in statute a requirement to do the planning. Kauai took the initiative. They did it. We could go to each county and ask them to do it. But even though we have some good administrations in office right now, we thought we w it would be best if we had a long-term uh, put in statute require it. Just a, a, as a function of transportation planning, this is how you're supposed to do it. So we went to the legislature with a bill last year that required each county to do uh, mode share planning and sh set mode share targets in six year increments and then report those mode share targets to the Hawaii Department of Transportation and they would include those in their, in their uh, transportation plan. Uh, the bill did quite well. It passed through every committee that it went through in both houses uh, without anybody testifying against it and without anybody on the committees voting uh, against the bill. It had a lot of support from basically everyone who, who was involved. Um, unfortunately, in the last committee, uh, they took the language out and replaced it with some emergency funding for uh, the Department of Transportation. And so the bill passed, but it wasn't actually the bill that we had introduced. So it was the victim of some immediate needs. Correct. Um, but not necessarily unsupported. That, that's correct. So I think this year we're going to come back with the same approach. Uh, we're going to try and do a little bit more legwork with some of the legislators. Uh, and some people in the community to, to build, um, not, not necessarily support, but just kind of understanding of the issues and how transportation planning is done now and how this would be a better way. Uh, and I think, we'll, I think this year we're going to get it passed. And what is it going to take in order to get the regulations put in place and see the, the targets um, set? You know, what kind of community involvement and who are they going to be the players? So it, it'll be done at the county level by the by the counties and each county is a little bit different in how they handle transportation and land use planning. So maybe it might be the Department of Planning and Permitting or the Department of Transportation Services on Oahu or it might be a joint effort. Uh, it might be the Metropolitan Planning or Organization like on Maui they just created the new one. Uh, but uh, I think we want to be a little bit on the less prescriptive side on the bill. Mm -hmm. Uh, and allow the counties to kind of uh, decide how they want to do the planning. And certainly on Oahu, it's going to depend on the outcome of our charter amendments because they involve changes within the uh, city and county of Honolulu transportation planning, right? P possibly, yes. Yeah. So there's a, there's a uh, charter amendment that would ha that would create a, um, a committee that would set fares for transit and also bring uh, bring heart into DTS. Uh, I'm Heart not being the rail trans rail system into Correct. the Department of Transportation Services. Correct for operations. Yes. Right. Yeah. So uh, we, we think that it would it would probably take a couple years to do the planning. There would be some community input. Uh, there would be you know working with uh, the state to see what the infrastructure capacities are. Uh, ultimately, uh, there would be a plan that would probably be adopted by the city councils or the county councils, and then after that, it would be uh, set up to the state. I want to interject one thing in here for how important it is that we have such a plan. So we have uh, a long-range transportation plan, the Oahu uh, Long-Range Transportation Plan. It goes out to 2040, and it's all our federal transportation dollars where they're going to go in local and state. And we're spending $17 billion over the course of, of that time to get us to 2040. And w what does that get us in terms of how many people are still driving and how many miles are occurring? Okay, so vehicle miles traveled will have increased 20%. Under the current plan? Under that plan, under our $17 billion spent, we will have more people as a percentage of our population commuting by, by single occupancy vehicle. I mean, we, so you think about that. We are investing heavily and we have a, a plan where we've thought this through and yet we're getting to outcomes I don't think many people would support when you actually see that and you tell that to people. Most people would say that's not the direction we should be going. And I think when we bring in a mode share target like this, uh, we're going to do those plans a different way and we're going to make investments in a different way. And it, that's actually a very important point because the other thing that we're going to experience is a huge explosion or further explosion, because we've already been experiencing it, of the visitor count. And so I've heard some of those forecast as, you know, we're, we're already at 10 million visitors, which no one ever imagined. And so we have to accommodate all of them on the road as well. Um, right. Is this... Uh, plan uh, or are the discussions including the leaders in the visitor industry? I think typically that's that's they are definitely included as stakeholders when the planning process is done. I think what we're really looking at doing is is reversing how we think of it. So you brought the visitor market. 
typically the way we do transportation planning now and the reason why we're getting a, a bad outcome in under the current Oahu Regional Transportation Plan is because the metrics that we're me measuring primarily is level of service. And so the, uh, the solutions to uh, worsening road congestion typically are add more lanes. Right. Uh, Mode share is a completely different uh, way of looking at it. We're looking, so we say we're going to have 150,000 tourists. How do we, if we have a mode share gar target of you know, 20% of them by rental car, how do we achieve that? It's right. we're looking at it, the outcome first and how do we achieve that versus this how many people we're going to have, we project they're all going to continue to drive. So how many more road miles? Exactly. It's a much more proactive uh, right. approach and it's a paradigm shift because it requires thinking outside the box and as you mentioned looking at where we want to be so these targets are extremely important right. so that we're driving the boat instead of the drive the boat driving us exactly absolutely important yeah so how can mode share targets be implemented Daniel do you want to? um so well um i think i think shems went into this a little bit but um i think it makes sense for them to occur at the the county level um, and for us to look at almost neighborhood by neighborhood, region by region, and figure out uh, what are the strategies that are going to work within those areas to achieve the outcomes. Um, so it requires a coordination also with the general plan and making sure that each community plan, each sustainability plan that all roll into the general plan includes transit-oriented development, multimodal transportation planning. It's a lot of coordination. Yeah, certainly I think from um, the land use and development perspective, that is uh, one of the most influential areas in whether people, how they get around, you know, whether they're close to their jobs, whether they're close to a grocery store and the amenities they routinely visit. Um, so um, using our, our land use plans and then when they come in and they're getting different development approvals, um, if we have a mode share goal in place, we can put that to a large development, to say a whole Pili and say, how are you going to attain these uh, mode share targets? Um, wh what are you doing to achieve these? And now I'm going to just be the devil's advocate a little bit here because sure. sometimes people say, you know, it's, it's, it's a dream to say, build it and they will come. We know that this involves major behavioral change in terms of people making those choices differently. Um, one of the things that I attended with Blue Planet regarding transportation, I believe several years ago, was a really cutting edge psychological workshop <laughs> on how we help people to change their behaviors and be able to move into these multimodal uh, uh, choices that we might have. Are you doing some work on that still at Blue Planet? And his bike share must also have a tremendous approach on how to get people out of their cars and on well, their that, bikes. That's a really good point. So there's, uh, and you hear this a lot. People say, you know, people in Hawaii, they love their cars. They're, you're not going to be able to get out of their cars. I think that there's actually uh, less truth to that than people realize. So mm -hmm. if you take uh, someone from Hawaii who born and raised, lived their entire life here, and you plug them into Tokyo or to Manhattan, Mm -hmm. or to an area where, like Davis, California, where everyone bikes, people tend to very quickly follow the, the existing norms in those communities. So it's not necessarily something that's ingrained in people. A lot of it has to do what, what, with what infrastructure exists. So if we had more transit capacity, if we had better bike lanes, then you would see more people taking transit, more people biking, and then that, that kind of cultural shift kind of automatically happens. So I think it's not that those things aren't aren't necessary, but I think it's not as it's not as the the car social mindset is not as impactful as people actually think it is. And I think if you look to say the example of Portland, you know, our kind of our, our bike mecca in the United States, um, we think about it as just this crazy culture that somehow embraces and loves cycling, and that's what it is now. But if you rewind 25 years, 1990. Portland actually looked much worse than Honolulu today. There was around 1% of people commuting by bike. And yet the city uh, took on building bikeways. And over the course of a couple decades, they built a very extensive network of bikeways. And it was a true, you build it and they will come. And with that, the culture, the culture that uh, surrounds it in terms of appreciating bikes, going for uh, fun rides and all that stuff, it came as a result of I think, in large part, the infrastructure that was built there. So, um, you know, it's, it's a tried and true, but I think it is, it is very true. You build it and they will come. What was the catalyst for Portland being able to get that done? 
So there was actually, there was a state law that required that um, all municipalities in Oregon spend 1% of their transportation funds on bike projects. And Portland hadn't been doing this. This law had been on the books since, I think, 75. Wow. And um, they got sued by actually the local advocacy, our, our counterpart in, in Portland. Um, and um, the city said, okay, well, we're looking at this. We really haven't been doing it. We're going to start doing it. And they asked it for a stay of the suit basically they would start doing it and it set them on a track where they said okay we're going to do this and we're going to do it vigorously and they got the positive feedback and that people were using the bikeways and it was improving the overall transportation system and and we know that it's also improved their visitor attractiveness because a lot of folks go to portland specifically to enjoy the outdoors and within the city get around without you know the hassle of a rental car I mean, something that we haven't hit on but livability is such a big component i mean uh, the livability of sitting in your car and sitting in traffic is not high but of being able to walk someplace and take transit on a on a um, reliable transit system uh, the livability of being able to bike to work to be able to bike to the grocery store to be able to bike your kids to school i mean those are things that people value and these are the kind of broader benefits we can get beyond the energy and beyond, um, you know, facilitating development in a harmonious way. I'm just wondering how schools are going to be tied into this transportation plan and how we're going to include kids' perspectives because we know that they're the best teachers to get their parents to change. So are you planning for um, school outreach or are you already doing that and making sure that schools are major stakeholders at the table and discussing the the plans? Well, it's, a, it's actually a really interesting uh, issue with schools in Hawaii. We have a, particularly on Oahu, we have a h very high percentage of students that go to private schools. And so uh, compared to most communities, we have more students commuting with their parents or their parents driving them to school. And that adds quite a bit of traffic congestion to our roadways. So I think uh, an important part of our mode share planning and our overall transportation plan is, is looking at how to address, how to, how to facilitate uh, students getting to school in ways that are a little bit more sustainable. Uh, maybe it's uh, a better transit system where the, where, and a safer one where the parents feel comfortable uh, putting their, their children on, on transit system. Okay. We also don't have uh, school buses, so we're looking at increasing school buses. In the last minute that we have, I'd like <coughs> to show what has been a tremendous success for Bike Share Hawaii, the King Street track. And can you tell us about it and how it's working? And oh, So the King Street uh, protected bike lane, uh, this is Protected bike lanes are the gold standard in Denmark and the Netherlands and Europe, um, and they're growing across the U.S. And you show that when you're in that protected environment where there's physical separation between uh, you bicycling and motor vehicle traffic, that all sorts of people that don't feel comfortable mixing in traffic suddenly are like, great, I want to cycle. Uh, we've seen about a doubling of ridership. Yeah, which is just pretty phenomenal, and pretty much everyone's come off the sidewalks and they're in the bike lane now. Um, I think this is the, the recipe. Once we build a network of these, we're going to see uh, tons and tons of people cycling. That's exciting. And those are planned in the transportation plan, but also are they just planned before we even get to a plan? So uh, we Grand have plan? a plan. Okay. The, the city <laughs> has a plan. Uh, we just need to implement that plan. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, you guys. I look forward to hearing the updates as we move along and especially supporting your efforts with the bill. This has been Sustainable Hawaii. Join us every Tuesday at noon at thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha.